Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today's guest is David Dunson. David is the Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor of Statistical Sciences at Duke University. Um, he is a recipient of the 2010 COPS Award. He's also written Bayesian Data Analysis, a book which is on all of our shelves. Um, for, uh, I think pretty much most of our statistical listeners know who David is, but for our less statistical listeners, I would strongly encourage you to go and survey David's work. Um, you know, even if you aren't using the modeling methods that he has developed or looking to apply the inference methods that he has developed. Um, even if you're not looking at the same applied topics in which he works, I would strongly encourage you to look at David's work because it is um, an excellent example of scientific thinking for statistical and data analysis methods. Um, and his, I think his sense of priority that he applies to these problems is something that is very imitable, or at least we can strive to imitate it. Um, and I personally, I found it very useful. So I strongly encourage anyone who's not familiar with David Dunson's work to just go check out his website. He has very accessible uh, presentations that are available online, uh, but go check it out. You'll certainly learn something about, I think, critical thinking, scientific thinking applied to important problems in data analysis. So, um, but with that, I think there's been enough editorializing on my part. Uh, the man of the hour, David Dunson, welcome to the show. Um, our topic today in part of the series is on um, what it means to advance uh, statistics and data science. And obviously, um, you're someone who I wanted to talk to on that because I think that your work has, um, I've, re I, I've really liked your, your continued focus on scientific inference and uh, scientific discovery while using machine learning statistical methods. Um, but again, enough editorializing. Um, how would you like to start this conversation on what do you think it means to advance data science and statistics? Okay, yeah, th thanks a lot for the introduction and the invitation. I mean, I, I guess that it's it's interesting, the, the, this kind of evolution of terms, but to, to me, kind of data science means that you're kind of working on, I mean, often it's it, it was more coming out of industry, I, mm -hmm. I think, that, that term, but to, to me, I, I have more of a scientific focus, and I, I often work really in, intimately with scientists. I'm trying to address scientific problems in and, and, and medical research, ecology, other areas. And even if it was outside of science, you'd kind of take bring a scientific thinking to that. And so, so then you're, you're, you're in, in, in having all this data being collected. So there's this vast amounts of data being collected in some discipline, and you want to answer questions based on the data, and so that data science problem is like, well, how do you do that? So how do you mm -hmm. kind of bring in the data and start answering questions, say scientific questions about the data, but they could also be policy questions or they could be in industrial questions. And this is the sort of science of doing that. And, and I think that it, statistics plays a really crucial role. I mean, I mean, if outside of statistics, if you just had like computer science thinking, that then you have no... Um, maybe not much uh, background or realization of things like the sampling design and and trying to do inferences on on quantities that might be be biased by the data that you're collecting and how the how the sample's been collected i mean if you're just collecting some sort of convenience data from facebook or something mm -hmm. or twitter or some sort of monitor it might be quite skewed towards certain types of data and, and it's crucial to be able to adjust for that. And so as statisticians, we have kind of background in, in how to think about that and, and also how to do kind of um, inferences on some sort of quantity of inference, uh, adjusting for uncertainty, I think. Whereas a lot of the tools that people get outside of statistics are more the machine learning tools are more kind of optimization based. And, and they, don't, they don't think as much or have as much training in this kind of issues of of sampling de design, selection bias, um, th 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 things like that, I think. And so I, I think though, the, even though the things like deep learning and everything have been kind of take, taking off, um, th this tendency to just take a bunch of data and then train some giant algorithm and then like, oh, let's just see how it works in some sort of prediction task. Um, there, there's only so far you can get with that. And there, there's a lot of pitfalls and dangers to doing that. And so thinking as a statistician, about those problems with the same types of data, I think will get you to a much, much different place and potentially a more reliable, more reproducible, uh, more scientific place. Yeah. Um, one thing one thing that I've sort of noticed, uh, if you think back, for example, uh, for the sort of, I guess, uncertainty quantification integration type techniques to inference versus, for example, optimization. Um, and I know that's too, like, just 
cutting them into two very broad categories. Um, thinking back to, you know, like the 1950s methods, um, like uh, simplex method for uh, linear programming, you know, there were a lot of things where essentially you were doing ca- ca- using calculating duals and um, essentially you had sensitivity analysis on some of these optimization techniques, um, you know, where effectively you could actually look at in and, and which way can we, uh, for example, read um, how, how sensitive are our um, linear programming coefficients, how sensitive is the solution to, to these coefficients and things like that. But yeah, it definitely does seem like um, farther now, farther ahead in the field with optimization, it does seem to be essentially, it's like we have these point estimates. Um, typically, you know, not, I don't want to do anyone in the optimization field in injustice, but, you know, lack of quantification around those, uh, around the uncertainty of those estimates. Um, um, a, um, or at the very least, if they are quantified, they might not actually be used in practice and things like that. And so um, one of the advantages of, you know, for example, um, like Bayesian techniques is that at least the uncertainty quantification, for example, is baked into the cake a bit. Um, I guess one, th- maybe one thing that would be good to uh, start off with those when, when you're talking about industry, are you talking, for example, about like the sort of like typical, like big tech, the Facebooks, the Googles, the lots of ad, like ad clicking, is that sort of the definition of industry that um, has these sort of like more optimization based techniques and essentially just throw a whole bunch of data at things? Um, I mean, I, I think that that's, to my knowledge, where the data science term comes from, that type yeah. of space. And um, so that's the, the, the sort of cliche anyway, mm-hmm. that where, where they're kind of um, have all this data streaming in um, and, and they're, they're kind of u- using optimization algorithms to make their kind of decision making on whatever ad placement and, you know, recommender systems and get various canonical problems in, in industry, which I, which I find to be quite different than, you know, scientific inferences. For, for example, um, I'm involved in one of the PIs in this kind of global biodiversity project we call life plan and so we're, we're collecting data all over the world on biodiversity of, of insects uh, fungi plants and animals trying to get more systematically collected data so you get this vast amounts of data but then based on those data you want to really be answering scientific questions and that that's a very it can be a very different pro- process than okay well I, I want some algorithm really fast uh, tell me where to place ads on a website so yeah that kind of, kind of thing and so um yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're both very big data problems, but if, if you're trying to do scientific inferences on biodiversity, you, you want to be, it's crucial to be able to adjust for sampling bias. It's crucial to be able to do, you know, characterize uncertainty in your, in your inferences. It's crucial to have interpretable parameters characterizing effects of things like climate on uh, biodiversity. Um, th- those things are act, uh, it's completely paramount. You know, where, whereas in, in ca- cases where you're doing just complete prediction-based um, me- me- methodology with, with a kind of financial bottom line, it's a bit different game, I think. Yeah. And actually, I think that brings up uh, one thing that I uh, like about your, I mean, obviously, I'm just a passive observer of your work, but, you know, on the issue of scientific discovery, where a lot of these um, more prediction-focused algorithms aren't worried about sort of um, illuminating sort of the mechanisms that underline the data. Um, or alternatively, that like I guess the um, the actual like data generative processes and things like that aren't they aren't at the forefront of people's minds when they're trying to evaluate. Well, has this algorithm succeeded? Has this model succeeded in some way? And um, while that has certainly been useful for um, a lot of the sort of big tech applications for the more traditional scientific applications, um, it's hard to say that science is progressing if you're only predicting on certain things. You know, maybe maybe that's perfectly fine when you're trying to, uh, for example, uh, improve or like in- have high pr- throughput measurements and things like that. And so a lot of these predictive models can actually help us gain more data that we might want to use. But at the same time, um, the absence of scientific discovery, it seems, um, for me, for example, in the medical machine learning area, it seems that scientific discovery has certainly taken a backseat to basically just seeing how much can we predict on the most recent data set that is available. Um, but yeah, so may, may, on the issue of scientific discovery, what, what do you think about the role that, for example, like Bayesian statistics has to play in that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you rose a re- uh, raised a really good point. I mean, I think that like one, one of the issues with this whole deep learning is that it can be quite not not reproducible and not very robust and like... Um, so you 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 do this whole process of trying to figure out what the architecture is, and then you might might have a bit of overtraining and everything like that, and and then um, at the end it, it's hard to interpret. 
Um, one thing I'm really interested in is is having complicated data. So you have complicated data where the, the data generating process might be quite complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, but can we can we back out something interpretable from that? And, and can we even even come up with some sort of theoretical guarantees? Um, so can we like identify some type of latent structure? And, and can we do it under um, try, trying to limit the modeling assumptions? Because one of the you could you could say, oh, Bayes is amazing. We can always get this uncertainty quantification, et cetera. But it sort of has some pitfalls as well, and so you 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 tend to make some modeling assumptions, and you might might not be very robust to those modeling assumptions in, in trying to infer some quantities that are of considerable scientific interest. And and so one example would be clustering, for example, so or or un, a type of unsupervised learning, a machine learning speak. And so I want to infer some late clusters in the data. And so a Bayesian approach, you would t- tend to take do model based clustering. You use a mixture model, so you just so do some sort of mixture of kernels. Um, if your kernel, like you have a cluster that's not exactly Gaussian shaped, it's like slightly different, then you might get completely the wrong clustering. It's like very not robust to those types of assumptions. And so I think one of the really interesting areas um, kind of moving forward is to make Bayes uh, more robust to modeling assumptions, so like generalized Bayes me- me- methodology, and, and also enabling um, some Bayesian thinking with machine learning algorithms. We, I just got an O&R grant on that where you're thinking, oh, I'm doing some machine learning algorithm, like maybe, maybe pro, um, principal components analysis or something. And, uh, but now I, I, I don't want to just do PCA and get my point estimate. I want to get you know uncertainty and I want to do PCA combined with something else and do something like I would do in Bayesian modeling. Um, but I, I want that simple interpretability of PCA. I want the speed. I want like people very familiar with PCA, some other machine learning algorithms. So I, how how do I kind of interweave that with an Bayesian approach and and get out the kind of desirable properties of Bayes, like uncertainty quantification, ability to model different types of data together. Um, but at the same time, I I, I might um, get some some of the sp- computational speed. I might get some of the ease of in familiarity. And I, and I might kind of reduce a little bit these kind of sensitivity to model misspecification. Yeah, I think uh, you did some work on essentially like PCA where it just uh, relaxed the need for like a linear uh, substructure, right? Um, and yeah. um, so, for example, like that, I th- um, uh, it, you know, it, it's it's something nice where I think like it didn't have a huge number of assumptions. Um, and tell me where I'm summarizing your work wrong, but you know, it's again like it um, is essentially it was to me it seemed like it was something where you could simply replace PCA with this new method, and you weren't essentially burdening yourself with large number of assumptions. In fact, you're relaxing them in one way. Um, and to me, that seemed just like a good, helpful advance for people who want to just essentially uh, apply a new method uh, that's a little bit less burdened and more representative of. What real life, you know, data generative processes are. Yeah, yeah. So the, I had this really fantastic student, um, PhD student in mathematics, uh, Di Dong Lee, who's now doing a joint postdoc due to the Zoom era. He can do this easily at UCLA and Princeton. Um, and so he came up with this thing we call spherelets or something. Yeah. And so you have this spherical version of PCA that puts in some curvature um, into it. And so that that yeah you know, can can help a lot. Some some simple modification like that. And also, I have a current student right now, Stephen Winter, who's working on tr- trying to come up with things like you have PCA, or you might have some generalization of PCA. Like, I, I, I really like sparse PCA, for example. That mm-hmm. gives you something really interpretable. It's really super useful. But then I'm like, I, I get like one estimate with one penalty, and I, I kind of feel like I'm reading tea leaves a little bit. And so, <laughs> Stephen is trying to come up with some generalized Bayes approach that allows you to do PCA, sparse PCA, these other variants of PCA. Uh, with, within what's called a Gibbs posterior, which is a type of generalized base pos- posterior, so you can have uncertainty quantification. So, yeah, uh, just a quick thing on definitions. Um, when we talk about complexity, are you talking essentially about where um, there's sort of still a the underlying structure is still a large P issue, where essentially there's still a high level of correlation um, across a large number of dimensions, or what? What is your preferred definition of? Complexity. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, like if I say like I, I like to, I tend to work on complicated data. Well, it, it tends to be high dimensional, so it, it, it would tend to be large P. Um, it, it tends to be you know um, an, another notion of complexity might be even if you have a linear model, like if you have really large P, that becomes pretty complicated. But 
I tend to be in settings where, well, there's maybe not linear, things are correlated, they're nonlinear, they're reasonably high dimensional, and so you have all this mess, and you need to somehow how, how deal with it. And so certainly there's formal mathematical definitions of complexity, but kind of informally, that's what I mean. Yeah, it uh, reminds me a little bit of, uh, is it the uh, Bengio and Berkstra paper, uh, where they talk about the value of random, just complete random sampling for optimization versus something like grid search. And one of the examples that they give is that effectively, when you're in a case, they say basically so many of these cases are where effectively you have low effective dimensionality. So grid search effectively is not computationally efficient because you're doing a lot of extra searches around these non-contributing dimensions. Um and this will get back to the uh, tech versus science thing a bit. I think we're uh, so effectively, if you're doing random sampling, at the very least, you're maximizing the number of samples along the small number of dimensions that matter. Um, whereas with sci- a lot of scientific um, applications, there are still a large number of dimensions that matter. You know, effectively, you could even just have a single categorical variable, which can make a vast difference in what the you might even effectively need two different models for different categorical variables. Um, depending on where they are, or alternatively just a better model. But, you know, um, so it seems like to me that there's, the again, it comes back to this issue of, like, what works for, like, some of these big tech applications versus what works for scientific discovery on complexity. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I like your grid point, uh, grid, grid search point, because um, we, we always, we, we, we seem to keep coming back to grid search and stuff <laughs> like that and trying to modify it. And, and, and this random thing, uh, there's a lot of really amazing work on... Um, kind of randomized versions of linear algebra and randomized versions of optimization and using ran- random matrix theory and random compression. And I think that those, those uh, ideas can be super useful both within Bayes and Frequentist. We've we played around with that in various contexts and trying to um, you know, speed, speed up Bayes, um, trying to compress the data using kind of things like random, ra- randomly compressing the data and still being able to maintain uh, predictive performance. And I have a student working on related things uh, with, uh, with jointly with J- Galen Reeves um, to try to s- speed up um, factor modeling, you know, and make the computation much more efficient. But um, yeah, so that that's just a comment on this kind of grid search, random, ra- random, randomized algorithm type 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 thread. But um, yeah, I mean the complexity. I mean, um, I think in machine learning, o- often you're maybe you just you have some giant neural network and you're thinking that you have some huge data set and and you're trying to kind of learn, learn this neural network and to train it for some sort of predictive task. Um, where, whereas in, in science, you're, we're, we're trying to understand all the pieces in this big puzzle. Um, and so that becomes a little bit more daunting in some sense. And so, because the, there can be complicated, as you mentioned, uh, definitely there can be a really important categorical covariate. It can interact with these other factors. And so what, one of the challenges is, well, if there are a lot of interactions, a lot of inter, um, complicated pieces, how do, how do we kind of make sense of that? How do we make sense of it from data sets that often aren't really enormous? Um, and, and how do we characterize uncertainty? And how do we get interpretable results while reducing dimensionality? And so if we, and if we go with just one notion of dimension reduction, like, oh, I'm going to put an L1 penalty on everything, like, <laughs> um, that, then that's maybe going to be misleading. Maybe there's other notions that, um, that which you were kind of referring to, I think, where there's some type of lower dimensionality that's, it's not just like throwing out variables or zeroing out coefficients. Maybe it corresponds to some, you know, complicated space like a manifold or some some other notion. Yeah, because especially, I mean, like um, you can throw out um, a given variable and essentially recreate it with all the other variables. Um, so there, there's something like, especially if you're wanting to, for example, it's popular to avoid. You might not want certain variables. Isn't well. You might not want a decision made because of a particular variable. And I maybe a classic example of this would be anything that you don't want people being discriminated against because of their characteristics. And so the idea is, you know, you could try to say, well, we could remove those variables from the um, from the equation. And it's like, yeah, and then the algorithm is just going to reconstruct those variables back with what's remaining. And there are some biological cases too with medical decisions where effectively you want to be removing some of these variables um, because effectively they have implications about the clinical track that they take. And you want to remove them out, but it's like you can't actually remove them ham-fistedly just by taking them out. Um, you, you, yeah, your algorithm will reconstruct. Yeah, we had worked on that. Um, you Maybe you saw that and that's what you're referring to too. But the um, 
problem in a couple of contexts. The one, the one was that kind of uh, r- racial problem. And so like um, we, we had a grant um, lar- largely due to um, collaborations with Christian Lum and um, James Jandro, who work a lot in this area or stars in this area, I think. Um, and so we're, we're trying to do, we have you know, like in criminal justice or something, and they, they want to use machine learning algorithms more to like set bail bond and like uh, the, you set initial, some initial decision re- recommendations. And so how do you do that in an automatic way? It's like, oh, we want to we want to remove race from the equation, so we we throw out race. That doesn't work at all because yeah. you can you can take the other variables you have and almost perfectly predict race. Mm-hmm. And so you have to do something more clever. We had a couple papers, and James and Christian have a have a well cited paper where you'll try to do something like you'll take your initial feature matrix and make it orthogonal to race or whatever like that. And then now we have the x tilde. Now we can feed mm-hmm. x tilde in any machine learning algorithm we want. Um, and, and we can show that that, that will be free, um, you know, actually free of, free of race. You can also do that same sort of thing to adjust for, like, um, you know, batch effects um, in, in medical studies. And so we, we have a paper, like, coming out in JRSSA on, on that, statistics and policy on, on, on th- those types of ideas. But, you know. And have you been able to retain the accuracy of uh, Yeah, those that was a really cool yeah. thing. Is I, I was amazed. I was so happy because they— um, for the one data set, you would remove African American ethnicity, mm-hmm. and it, it didn't actually hurt at all your ability to predict resi- recidivism. Oh, and so I was like, it's just l- using um, the, the variables in a different way. And so, you know, sometimes that might not be the case, of course. But in this one example, anyway, that we had, that it it didn't hurt you at all in terms of predictive accuracy. So you could make it uh, non-racist and 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 not pay a price for it. Yeah. In that way. It- yeah, no, that, that is nice in the instances where you can uh, eat your cake and have it too, uh, where you can essentially achieve these uh, secondary goals, uh, or maybe that should be the new primary goal. Um, but, you know, you can as- achieve multiple goals and still, uh, you know, uh, with, without detriment. For my, I, I remember one of my cases where it just, um, you know, it was impossible. Eventually, I just had to give up on removing some of these extra clinical features and just saying, I'm going to start stratifying and triaging uh, different models. But, you know, it, it, maybe if I had Christian Lum uh, to help me out with that, it would. Uh, well, it would turn I mean, maybe again. those variables are really important in predicting your response, and so yeah. if you're trying to remove them, then like that, then you're going to take. Yeah, may, maybe inevitably take a big hit in predictive accuracy. That maybe you have to, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if it is fundamental to the data generative process, um, which in medical applications it frequently is. Um, was there anything else that you thought would be worth talking about on complexity? I wanted to move on um, to some questions about uh, big data. Bayes and non-parametrics. Um, but first, was there anything else that you want to cover with uh, complexity? I mean, I guess not. Let's move on. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the other things I think is like uh, the issue of, you know, we have these enormous data sets. We have Bayesian methods. We have Bayesian non-parametric methods, um, to which I'm partial. And um, how do I want to wrap this? I was going to maybe wrap into some of the uncertainty quantification, but, you know, um, not all Bayesian methods, for example, suffer from um, the uh, large large data sizes. And effectively, I was, I was just wondering, like, to what extent, if you're trying to retain, for example, uncertainty quantification, uh, to what extent is it the nature of the Bayesian models that create these extra burdens that, you know, you've been working on your, uh, you know, expediting Bayesian inference around and things like your, uh, you know, high-dimensional data versus approximate MCMC. Um, you've done a lot of work to make Bayesian methods work with these large data sets. And I was just wondering a little bit, how much of these are inherent to like Bayesian models versus the fact that we also prefer Bayesian non-parametric models and things like that? It's a big glob of a question, but... Um, if no, that's a great to, question. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, because like, I think if you... I mean, because um, some some of the uh, work, you know, trying to scale in machine learning and stats and stuff, trying to scale Bayes up is, is kind of working on problems where it's sort of easier than they're they're kind of putting on in some sense, because... Let's say if we had a parametric model, like we have a logistic regression model, and yeah, it's like not, Bayesian logistic regression. Yeah, yeah, it's like Bayesian logistic regression or whatever. It could have a lasso on um, penalty. <laughs> I mean, like a double exponential prior or whatever, you know. But it's Bayesian logistic regression, and then um, and let, let's say it's not complex in the sense that it's there's not a gajillion predictors in it. There's some, <laughs> you know, mo- maybe modest number of predictors, and you have a huge sample size, and like, oh, I'm worried about scaling up. Um, so a lot of the stuff I see is they. What they tend to do is they, they tend to do like a full data Laplace approximation. Um, m- maybe they do that in a fast way. Mm-hmm. But like if I can do that in a fast way, I probably could have just done an optimization thing in a fast way too because yeah. it's the same math. 
um, the same type of algorithms. And so if I have a full data Laplace approximation or like a full data asymptotic normal approximation, like basically I get an approximation of the mode and um, or some sort of fast algorithm, we get the, the map estimate really fast. That, that's mm-hmm. going to be basically maybe the same types of algorithms I would use for um, like maybe some map reduce based thing or something for doing uh, for for getting just a you know penalized logistic regression estimate uh, in a really really large um, large settings and so well I get the map estimate then maybe I you know could differentiate about the mode using standard things and then maybe that's all I need probably because um, the Bayesian central limit theorem Bernstein von Mises is like kicking in the sample size is enormous uh, the posterior is pretty Gaussian. And so I don't really need some sampling algorithm or core sets or all this kind of fancy stuff. Um, I, I can just use one of the good old Laplace approximation or some large sample uh, Gaussian approximation, and and that's that's going to be pretty good, you know. And so um, if 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 that large sample Gaussian approximation isn't good, then frequentists might use something like the Bootstrap or something. Well, the Bootstrap is also pretty computationally intensive, and so maybe that's just that's sort of like the frequentist ber- version of going to MCMC. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that where where you need something maybe more clever is when, you know, one of two things happen, and, and they're kind of similar in some sense. You, you either go kind of non-parametric, or or you go like high, you have high dimensions, and so you have, you know, like a really large number of predictors in your regression or mm-hmm. something like that, or very high high di- high dimensional multivariate data, um, and or you have kind of a, a non-parametric approach, but. We're, we're getting a lot of tools now, I think. You, you know, one, one canonical area is sort of Gaussian processes, say for spatially dependent data, it could be, but it could be also non-parametric regression where, okay, now we have like uh, geo, geospatial data around the entire world and like there's like millions or tens of millions of observations in space and time. And we, we really have algorithms now to handle that, you know. Um, with, with, with GPs, you, there's all sorts of clever algorithms developed by, for example, Sudipto Banerjee and his, um, his his team, Alan Gelfand before that. And so, and, and this kind of keeps going on, and there's all these kind of DAG GPs and clever partitioning methods. And so, I think there's a lot of, like, clever work out there. Um, and and it's maybe not not the most promising thing I would say actually to just do something like okay well what do you do in an optimization setting well if I if I have a huge huge data set I'm trying to fit a deep neural network I tend to use like some sort of stochastic gradient descent or something well in MCMC I could do the same thing I could just now wh- why is it so much harder I'm just instead of like running a stochastic gradient descent I could run stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics. Um, Maybe not all that much, all that different. In fact, there's a lot of theory relating those two things now, um, and maybe that'll be that'll be fine. And then I'm scalable enough. But you know, I, I think that often this kind of subsampling approach to uh, to scaling up Bayes isn't actually a great solution. And th- there was a really beautiful paper by um, by James Jandro, Natesh um, Palai, and Aaron Smith recently on. No, no free lunch for approximate MCMC, where they they kind of describe like pretty pretty broad. They undersell it, but it's pretty broad theoretical results um, suggesting that if you do subsampling, you know something has to give. E- either you're going to be um, inaccurate, mm-hmm. or your algorithms or the subsample is going to have to be so big that it's like not useful <laughs> computationally. Yeah. So. So I found that fascinating, and it was interesting that it, that's kind of driven some of my work away from the subsampling. Like in G, in the GP literature, scalable GP literature, people don't use subsampling. They do more like, okay, well, I have this matrix inversion bottleneck. I need to be clever about making the matrix sparse and doing sparse matrix computation, mm-hmm. things like that. And I think that kind of moving forward... Personally, I, I just like to scream Cholesky yeah. at my matrix until it just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a huge Cholesky. No, I think that uh, moving forward, I, I think that this kind of gap between this kind of clever optimization, scaling optimization, mm-hmm. and this kind of Bayes and scaling Bayes is not not as large as people think. And um, there's just been more people working longer on the optimization side of things. And and I think that some of those tools can be adapted uh, into into Bayesian even sampling um, settings to get uncertainty quantification and big complicated models. What about um so if we if we haven't uh 
I guess uh, so. There's, I guess, sort of like the subsampling issue. But what about other other techniques that you can have? For example, like relaxing the need for, uh, you know, like the actual like Markov chain properties and things like that. Where effectively, are any of those, or alternatively, instead of uh, distributing your contribute, uh, your distributing your computation and uh, working on subsets, where effectively you might distribute your computation for the selecting the next uh, sample point um, and things like that. Um, are, are any of the, wh- which of those are still in play in your mind um, as far as what has a chance going forward? I mean, I think a lot, there's a lot of really super interesting ideas. Um, Cause I, I think that to me, I, I, once we get in this super big data regime, we're sort of back to classical problems and statistics because, you know, like when we're running a study, we can't go out like a medical study or we're trying to ask people questions or something. We can't go out and ask everyone in our whole, the whole US population we can't get a sample from them and ask some questions or get a blood sample or whatever. So what do people do? Well, they they do some the, the, some some sample survey sample design or something. They they try to get a representative smaller sample um, where you can feasibly do it. And so I, I think in a lot of cases you can do the same thing um, in in the big data computation setting. And so where you know things like stochastic gradient, it tends to just take a random sample, which is pretty stupid um, if you think about it. And so, so taking some sort of like thinking about survey sampling and taking some bias sample that's like more informative about um, in a targeted way, um, that, that's really I think a promising idea. A, a related idea to that, a really closely related idea, is core sets. Um, Tamara Broderick and her group and other people have worked a lot usefully on that. I think where. You're trying to get like a smaller subset of data that's representative. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's really promising. I think looking at MCMC and saying like, okay, well, I'm running MCMC. Here's some bottlenecks in that. And so I'm not going to like just like try to converge to exactly the right posterior. That, that, that's silly because I would have to run it too long. And there's too many kind of hardcore theory wonks and bays who are like demanding that in the stats mm-hmm. literature. I think instead, maybe you're like, okay, well, I'm approximating this Markov transition kernel and this one and this one. And then ideally, maybe that's a perturbation of the original uh, Markov chain. And maybe it'll ideally converge to a perturbation of the uh, the original target posterior. And that's something we worked on a little bit, but under over, uh, uh, overly restrictive theory conditions. So I, I think that, um, sorry for the, uh, whatever that sound is in the background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I think that those, those directions are promising. Um, yeah, and, and, and being clever about doing, uh, having a distributed com- computation and even using GPUs. We found like in this ecology data sets, we we're trying to scale up. Um, we have these joint species distribution models that we're trying to apply to like tons of species because now we have this like automated DNA sampling and everything. And so just huge numbers of species you do usual MCMC, you're like, oh, it's not going to scale up. But we have a, have a collaborator, Gleb, who just like, oh, he took a GPU, so he had this super GPU thing, and he sped it up by 500 times, just like smart coding with GPUs, just with a re- regular MCMC algorithm. So uh, I think there's going to be a combination of those things. Um, and hopefully there'll be more tools that people can like, um, you know, seamlessly integrate um, mm-hmm. into, their, into their Bayesian inference algorithm. And more use of that sort of thing in probabilistic, uh, you know, programming languages like Stan. Because now you have like a big data set you throw at a Stan, it's going to just choke. But um, mm-hmm. um, and you have to like hand design something special for each case. But I, I hope that we have a bigger toolbox, and I think we will moving forward that we can kind of put in these kind of big data scalable tricks into probabilistic programming, and it, it ideally would be able to just automatically figure out. Um, depending on what case you're in, which which algorithm to use. Yeah, it seems that a lot of because um, obviously um, when you're working, well, how was that? At least when I'm working in the apply, on applied issues, which is the only thing I work on, um, there's always a huge draw to try something ad hoc. So essentially, like you take a good idea and then you do a little ad hoc thing just to make it work, um, and so that um, and. Um, but the problem with that is obviously by making it ad hoc, you're immediately throwing out maybe a lot of the like good like asymptotics and guarantees that you might have um, by having something that is essentially well designed. Um, but you know, if again, if 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 the two pipes don't meet up, what are what are you going to do? Are you going to just say I, I I can't use these other methods until they are more readily available, or um, you know, do I just try to make something ad hoc? And as um, 
as faithful to the original uh, method, the more, I guess, computationally sound or uh, well-grounded method. Um, but maybe that's, um, you know, that is a small bit of commentary. But um, do you think that as these methods become more available, um, that people will have less of a motivation to be using more like ad hoc, unprincipled statistical methods or unprincipled methods, less statistical methods? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great question. It's it's one of my um, kind of beefs in some sense with the uh, the way the statistics academic world goes and journal publishing and everything it, it is that um, the game is to like you get all these kind of strong theory guarantees, which, which often are asymptotic. Um, and so and, and there's there's they pay less attention to these kind of practicalities. And so they'll be claiming that it's like applied to some large problem. And then it's really not that large. Mm-hmm. Um and then they get it in a top journal because they have a bunch of theory, um, which is often not all that innovative anyway on, on asymptotics. And then like a practitioner like like me, I tend to work on real world problems. And then so you, you tend to have to use some sort of ad hocery or like just smart kind of data science in some sense uh, to, to get to get methods to work um, when you have like really complicated large data. That that's unavoidable. Like even in the coding, like you have some <laughs> algorithm. Like you have each of these steps and you're like, oh, well, like here, like it's like we get all these divide by zeros. We need some sort of fudge factor here and here. And I mean, that's sort of inevitable in, 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 in real world practice. And, and I, I would love to be able to have the journal, journal editors and the community more focused on the kind of pragmatic bottom line and like real world applied problem solving and like making more important practical innovations in that be driving things more than you know, how many theories on rates of convergence you have in your paper. I mean, that, that would be fantastic. And, and that would decrease the, um, the barrier to you and other practitioners in, in applying these, you know, seemingly clever and relevant uh, approaches that you'll see in JASA or JRSSB or somewhere um, to your problems. There would be less of a gap if people were paying more attention to the kind of pragmatic and practical details and and what bottom line impact it has on your applied inferences, mm-hmm. and, a bit, and then a bit less on the uh, you know the asymptotic theory, which often doesn't tell you that much anyway. So. Um, do you think that just to go on that idea very briefly, do you think that if people were motivated to focus on essentially the scientific discovery aspect of the data analysis, where um, if we put a higher weight on making strong scientific discoveries or alternatively just quantifying how much how much ignorance we have that remains on a certain phenomenon uh do you think that would help would that ameliorate the problem in any way or do you think it's just essentially adding one more artificial barrier that people have to jump no, i mean through? i think that 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 goes an enormous that's a really insightful comment I, I think that that goes an enormous way to reducing the problem i mean i think the reason that that I'm saying this really is that we're, 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 we tend to be trying to solve a scientific problem. And then you're, you know, a lot of what you do is not like, oh, we, oh, we need to get the paper in JASA. Let's like write a theorem or something. But mm-hmm. then you're like, really, the important part is like, well, we need some model. We need some methodology that will actually, you know, tell us something important in this applied problem. And we'll address what my ecologists or geneticists or biologist friends um you know, the questions that they're trying to ask of their data, the scientific questions. And so we that's really, really hard to try to figure out from complicated data how to answer those questions, how to design the algorithms for doing that. And so um, they seem to be setting off fireworks, even though it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this it's a is little a, too late for that in the middle yeah. of the day, but sorry about that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that if you're focused in on that, then then that should make the uh, methods much more much more pragmatic. Um, I think one of the dangers, I guess, that there, there there ends up being somewhat of a divide, though, and because the, then there's this kind of theory and methods community that will just be working. They, you, I work in some area. I work in community detection and networks, and then I'll work away on on theory on that and algorithms, and I'll write like I can be a successful academic career doing that. And then there's somebody else working on like statistical genetics in the trenches, and then they'll write maybe maybe most of their papers in genetics journals, and it's like not even really like new statistics research. And so I, I would love to be able to decrease that divide, um, and that that's sort of like maybe one of the reasons I've been more successful is I, I try to try to do a little bit of both, but but really the 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 main thing I'm interested in is 
developing like new method, developing and applying like new methods motivated by apply, um, you know, trying to solve real world problems, which they're typically scientific problems because of my background, but could really be anything. Yeah. What, um, so just to push back on the sort of scientific idea, because one, one of the other things that you don't want people to do those become essentially methodologically nihilistic or nihilistic around the importance of asymptotic properties and things like that, the various actual mathematical properties of the models. And so, um, and you could, especially like I could take for myself, someone who's of like marginal mathematical talent, you know, like I, I have a bachelor's degree in mathematics, but still, um, you know, I'm, I'm not top level mathematical talent. I do though, always endeavor to have a strong understanding of the mathematics that underline the particular models that I'm using. And I think that's important because, you know, when things break in machine learning, like you need to understand the math and also just to diagnose, um, uh, to diagnose why certain algorithms don't work. Some of them have actually very like strong mathematical reasons why this algorithm, for example, won't work for an anomaly detection method and things like that. Um, especially when you're popping down uh, kernel densities in places and you're wondering, well, why doesn't this work uh, for uh, for anomaly detection method? But anyway, um, to avoid- but I, no, I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, so I, I didn't mean to, uh, to mean, mean to say that Oh, we're only putting mathematics in our paper to get it in. Um, I, I just um, I, we 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 want to have useful mathematics mm -hmm. in the papers that that that'll tell us like something about why the algorithm or method works or doesn't work, mm -hmm. instead of just like things that are like window dressing. Yeah, that don't what, tell us anything. <laughs> what what are sort of for the people who are. Uh, less sort of enthralled with the asymptotic properties of any given model or method. Um, what would you encourage them to like look at? Like, what are the important properties that you would say you should focus on? Whether or not your model is this asymptotic property or this one, um, for example, are, are there is there a subset where you think that they are actually more core to good scientific inference? Sure. I mean, like, I mean, if if you can get some result, like the um, you know some type of Bernstein von Mises result, where like, um, say, you have a Bayesian posterior and you want. You want to say, oh, like, oh, I'm getting this credible interval, and it has valid um, valid coverage. This can be interpreted as a frequentist confidence interval. That's a really quite nice result <laughs> because, um, you know, you'd be surprised how often that doesn't happen, <laughs> you know, in complicated models. And so, if you could get a, re a result like that, I mean, I, I think often studying the kind of mathematical properties of your model, other other than um, other than Asymptotics. I mean, it's nice to really show basic asymptotics. Like, mm -hmm. oh, at least this thing's consistent. So I, I feel yeah. better about that, you know. And and so um, and then if I could even show, yeah, if it had an optimal rate, that would be nice. And then if, if even more, if the uh, intervals have valid coverage, that's really important. I think particularly it's particularly important as you go away from like usual Bayes. And so now if I'm taking a generalized Bayes approach, then you're like. Oh well, now I replace the likelihood with some weird thing. Like, mm -hmm. well, how do I interpret that then? Mm -hmm. Like, does it have a Bayesian decision theoretic foundations? Can I prove that mathematically? Um, does it have you know frequentist asymptotic guarantees in terms of uncertainty quantification? Like, characterize um, like I have some you know BVM type result where my intervals have the right coverage. So that's particularly important as you take a step away from Bayes because then it just becomes. You could be just doing crazy stuff. Like I, I saw some talk at, um, at ISBA, and they, they had some generalized Bayes approach, and then, you know, really like, well, what about your uncertainty? You're not telling me anything about uncertainty, but they have some parameter controlling how concentrated the po the, the kind of fake posterior is. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to choose that, and so it completely determines how concentrated it is. And so, basically, uncertainty quantification is completely unreliable. And but may, unless you can maybe use some asymptotic theory or something to choose that key parameter, and so that's really important. I think showing properties like um, like that, that your Bayes approach is well calibrated, and so um, so I, that's really important. I think often. Say, say I ha I'm, I'm doing my Bayesian, Bayesian approach, and now I have some out-of-sample data, and I'd like to predict or something. And then now, um, you, you know, calibration means I get sort of a, my, my my predictive distribution for the out-of-sample data is like valid. It's not like un it's not biased somewhere. It's not like too narrow or too too fat. That's really important. And and so often often like you can potentially prove that, and you can also you you know just try to estimate some type of calibration plot. Um, showing showing approaches like uh, coherence, you know, and so it, particularly if, if we go to some generalized Bayes approach, you would like to be able to have some properties like, oh, I start out 
Now I come in, I have some initial posterior. Now I come in with some more data. Now I can coherently update it. If I'm marginalized out, I get back to the original thing. If you don't, then it becomes really seemingly ad hoc um, if you don't have some sort of basic probabilistic uh, uh, appealing properties. And so you know, a lot of the math that, that can go into a paper might be just showing some of these uh, probabilistic properties uh, you know, that, that are not, not asymptotic, and, and that's really important. Yeah, because um, one of the ways that I sort of, when I'm approaching a problem, I look at sort of like, what what do I deductively know about the problem versus what sort of inductively do I know? Um, and that at least helps me not just completely crash into walls. Um, or at the very least, I've had enough times where I either was uh, making the wrong assumptions about the actual like content of the data or the nature of the data, or I misunderstood um, an implication of the model, and I was essentially making incorrect deductive conclusions about the model uh, because I straight up misread uh, some of the properties. And so it does seem like um, for things like um, these, like asymptotics and these mathematical properties, you don't want to, th- well, you don't want to entirely throw them out because, for example, they might have very strong deductive value. And when you are trying to reason, you know, deductive guarantees are always nice. Um, but at the same time, to the, whatever extent they get violated, if they if they can fall away very quickly, and so I guess uh, one of the one things I was wondering is, um, are there specific ways that you sort of try to, um, if you're trying to make a model with fewer um, assumptions, is there is there are there are there places where you can focus on that? Is, is that is that a valid question where you should essentially say I would like to sort of create new methods that just have fewer assumptions around them? Or does that just lead, is that just too broad of an, of an issue? Yeah, no, I mean, that's something I, I really want to be able to do. I'd like to, um, because, you know, the, the pitfall it would be to me in complicated data is if you follow it religiously, you need to model everything. <laughs> and so it's not really possible to like really, to, to accurately model everything. And so as you start to model everything, you're going to have like overly simple models and things. And then and then now you have a lot of model. And so when you have a ton of model, maybe you, you know you don't m- m- might be able to check all the modeling assumptions. That might be daunting. And, and you might have more ramifications of too much model. And so <laughs> you know, some things we're trying to work on uh, that is up in the air, like the, the, um, the one thing I was really happy with, which, um, w- which was collaborative with Jeff Miller, who was my former postdoc, who's now on the faculty at Harvard. Um, he was a fantastically bright guy. Um, we had this approach where you'd say, okay, well, we, we still want to do, because there, there's two philo- there's a couple different philosophies. You could say that well, all models are wrong, and so let's like go non-parametric and have some giant model that's super flexible like along the lines of a Bayesian version of a giant deep neural network or some huge Gaussian process or something. But then that's like not interpretable, and so at the end of the day, you might need to be extracting interpretable functions or summarizing it somehow anyway. And so another approach to say is, okay, well, the models are all wrong, but maybe it's like pretty close. And so I want a model that's like pretty close, but I don't want to assume it's right. And so usual Bayes like just always assumes like, oh, if I have a list of models, one of them is exactly right. And then as you get more data, like I'm going to put probability one on the one model that's exactly right. And so that's kind of bogus in a lot of ways. And so what Jeff and I did in this kind of C Bayes paper was to say, okay, well, let's condition on the event that the, um, the, the data, the empirical distribution of, of the data you observe are close to that of the presumed model. And so you're, you're just saying that instead of saying, and instead of make, using Bayes' rule, um, assuming that you got the model exactly right, you're, you're saying it's have some notion of, you know, uh, the model's close to right. Okay? Um, and then that, that actually has worked pragmatically pretty well. I mean, it's just an initial small step in the right direction, I think. But for problems like clustering or variable selection, like clustering is super not robust to the kernel. So you have some mixture of Gaussians. And then like, here's an example of like proofs that really interesting to me, but like are really not very practically interesting is that you're, you're saying, okay, I'm just going to show consistency in clustering or rates of estimating the true clustering or something. What does everyone assume? Well, they assume the model is exactly rightly, correctly specified. So you're, cl- you're, you're um, a given cluster, the data within a cluster is exactly a Gaussian, ex- like exactly. 
So what happens asymptotically when it's like not a Gaussian, but like some tiny, like ridiculously small perturbation of a Gaussian? Well, then you get infinitely, many, you get like more and more clusters. This is, it's going to break that cluster into many, many Gaussian clusters. So it's, it's completely brittle. So I, I would view that theory as not practically useful. Um, and so what we found in the C base is, and other people have, like Lee Ma has had students working on um, applying it to um, quite complicated large data sets, is that, that allowing the small degree of robustness, that, that can actually give you a much more robust or reasonable uh, posterior on the number of clusters um, than, than if you're kind of driving it completely based on model assumptions. And so, you know, some things are much more robust to model assumptions than, 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 than others. Um, and an another extreme I think that people take will, will be to use what's called a Gibbs posterior where they, they have a prior times e to the minus a tuning parameter times a loss function. So if that's a log likelihood and you make the, the constant one, then, then it's just the usual Bayesian posterior. But you could put out some other loss function there. Um, and there was this really brilliant paper by Basiri et al., Chris Holmes and, and Walker, et cetera, in Jerris's B in 2016, showing that that was actually like if you didn't have a likelihood, and you you were kind of do, doing a, a Bayesian update a update of belief functions, then this is actually a completely valid and principled thing to do. Um, and so that was really nice, and that that's kind of motivated some of our recent work. But then the problem with that is that then you've like thrown out too much of the model. Like the nice thing about Bayes is you have models. Now I just have that loss function again, and I. Mm -hmm. I can't like choose my tuning parameters, my hyperparameters. I, I don't have the Bayes invisible hand to do that. I, I have trouble calibrating uncertainty. I have trouble modeling different pieces of the data together. And so um, it's kind of an open, interesting area to, to try to develop. You know, C Bayes is promising, I think, but, and there's some other, other ideas out there, but trying to take a step, like ha maintain the modeling, the, uh, the nice aspects of Bayes, but making it more, uh, less brittle to model assumptions and, and less less uh, um, you, you less have to model everything. So because we, we don't want to model everything in a big complicated data set. On, on the topic, uh, while we're sort of circling around the issue of uh, model specification, regularization, Bayes, um, um, you, you've, you've thrown out the term hyperparameters and I'm immediately thinking about like, for example, hyperpriors over uh, Gaussian processes and things like that. Um, to what extent do you think that people are, a lot of sort of nominal Bayesians are actually using, for example, priors to specify their certainty slash ignorance of certain parameters, or as opposed to, for example, just using it as a, a regularizer that takes a probability density as its form? Um, does that, does that, is that, you, I mean, do you mean, uh, are they using like fully Bayes versus some sort of version of empirical Bayes or pragmatic Bayes where you'll, or just like in their heads? Like, I know you obviously can't guess what people are thinking, but to some extent, it seems like, like a lot of people, um, uh, it seems yeah. like, you know, people aren't always using priors to describe what they think. They're saying, like, I'm going to set this prior because if I don't, my uh, covariance matrix will become, uh, like odious to like invert and things like that. And it's like, you know, um, and I'll admit, like, I'm guilty on some of those things where I'll fix a parameter or two just to make life not go crazy. And I think that those parameters are more or less correct. But at the same time, you know, again, it does get to this issue where um, there's, you're, I mean, there's a statistical implication. Yep, go on. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you mean. And so the um, I, I'll do the same thing, like a Gaussian process with the covariance parameters is a great example. Like, well, those things don't mix very well, and they're a big pain in the ass. So so I might I might try to hand hand choose them at a good value. Um but in general, I think that, and as long as it doesn't make a big difference, fine. But the, um, in general, I think people have trouble thinking about the priors. And I think it's really, really, really important. It's like if you're, if you're any sort of Bayesian, even just very pragmatic, just kind of using the tools to, to, to think about what the prior is doing or hyper priors, you know, sample from it, sample from the damn thing. Like yeah. in the Gaussian process case, Sample from the hyperprior, draw a realization from the GP, uh, do that a bunch of times. Like, that's one of the nice it's things. Reasonable. It's like, yeah, it's the one of the nice things is like a lot of these things, there's a nice computational way where you can actually visualize it. And, you know, to, to the extent that we have essentially like three to four dimensional monkey brain to like apply to these problems, you know, that seems like it's one of our, um, it's one of those lifelines that we can have. Because um, I think that you really don't, I mean, because, um, 
Because the prior is important. I mean, I, I'm not a big believer in like objective bays. I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of those approaches, no offense to Jim Berger, who's a, who's a brilliant guy. Um, it just, I don't know, like I'm trying to use a minimal training size to like do this model selection. I, they just, I don't know. They just don't seem that reasonable. I think if you can try to think about what your prior is doing and choose like Gel, what Gelman calls a weekly informative prior, I, I think that's really good practice. And to do that, you can't just like, Students do that, including PhD students at Duke. I had a meeting right before this where the student, we had this model like for phy- phylogenetic um, processes, et cetera, and um, it's got some results. And he's like, well, the, um, you know, my, I, if I do a simulation with the variances on the boundary and then I choose this, then I run it and like it's really vague. And so, but, he, but he just chose a prior out of, th- out of thin air somewhere. He has no idea what this prior is doing. And, and you have to go back and like, you have to, I, well, I just made the same recommendation, like sample from it, sample from the, the whole, whole, whole hierarchy, including then the data and then seeing whether it's reasonable and then you get a plausible range of variation that's in agreement with your, your, the, your knowledge you have. Um, and, and that can be done. I think that it's not really true that you can't do that at all. And even high dimensions, like let's, I have some giant, I have some giant, ginormous numbers of variables and I'm doing some shrinkage thing. Well, I probably have a couple of these key hyperparameters that are controlling like the degree of shrinkage, uh, regularization. And so, um, you know, I can sample from that and be, and then even sample from the prior predictive distribution of the data, which, and if the variance is like infinity, then maybe I'm <laughs> thinking my prior is too vague and, and I, I can see how many uh, values that I get that are uh, large or out in the tails and, and whether those are reasonable, plausible values. And so I... I, I think that people don't tend to do that. I think that I agree that uh, most people, they'll, they, they don't know how to choose these priors. They'll use some recommendation from the previous paper, from Stan or whatever, or they'll just like slap something down. They, they'll want to make the variance somewhat like, like arbitrarily high, and then they'll just run it. Um, and that's what most people do. What about, uh, for example, like not considering how your priors and your inference method will interact? So, for example, um, you know, if you're using a map method and you're choosing these really pointy priors, and then on top of that, when you're, say, you're going to do multi, uh, you're going to have a non-convex uh, space that you're sampling, obviously. And so, um, you know, um, do you actually, for example, when you're choosing the different starting points that you might want for a map method, um, that that could have very strong implications about where actually your optimization algorithm ends up. Um, versus, so for example, if you're doing elliptical slice sampling and you're saying, okay, does this prior right here, will that prevent me from actually locating the next, uh, like an acceptable um, proposal uh, for, the, for the next space? And uh, it, it sometimes seems that people don't, as I'm a little bit split between this, because one, I feel like when I, take too much of that into consideration. I'm being a little bit too hand toony maybe not enough principled. I'm not thinking hard enough. But at the same time, if I have a strong knowledge of what sort of the biological mechanism that informs this prior is, and I spend enough time watching these inference algorithms that work, that I know sort of how they sort of work themselves into little uh, dead ends and things like that. Um, that's not a coherent thought, but uh, it, it no, is. No, I think that's yeah. a really clear thought to me, I guess. Um, I, I think that... Um, yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, like, if you're some religious Bayesian, you're like, oh, I just, like, forget all that. I'm just, mm-hmm. here's my prior. Um, mm-hmm. And it's some complicated thing <laughs> or something. And then you run it, and, and it doesn't work well computationally. Mm-hmm. I think that Bayesians who work on real-world applications, yeah, you have to think about the interplay between your prior, the algorithm you're using, and, like, the impact on the posterior. And then you want you want to put real prior information in your prior, but you also want the prior to have a form and the model to be parameterized in the form that, that leads to good computation and, 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 and it leads to like not too many of these problems you're mentioning. And I, I think people often do ignore that. Like a great example is the Bayesian lasso um, where, um, you know, the, the lasso is great because the, po- the, the mode, the, the map estimate is going to be sparse, but then like none of the draws are sparse. And so like if you're doing kind of a Bayesian sampling based approach, then, then why are you using the lasso? Like, if you want sparsity, you should use, I don't know, the horseshoe or the generalized double predator or Dirichlet Laplace. You should use some, you know, well-designed sparsity prior because the lasso is not good for that. It would be like, oh, it has slightly heavier tails and ridge. And so if you're using it in a shrinkage context where you basically just want to shrink all the parameters but don't want any sparsity, it's totally fine. 
But I think people naively think like, oh, it's la- there, here's a Bayesian version of the lasso. Let's try that. Whereas like there's no sparsity at all in that. And it's not doing at all what you wanted to do if you wanted sparsity. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of na- 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 naivete like that going on, I think. Um, and, and in practice, I think to do a really good job from an applied perspective, which is what I tend to be interested in, we need to think about, okay, we have this problem. You know, what, what's the kind of trade-off between the algorithm, the prior, and, and the scientific information I have? And I want those all to kind of come together in a good way. And that, that's sort of like proper Bayesian data science, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that, that is cool. Um, we have uh, only about uh, a little less than 20 minutes left. And some of the things I want to uh, talk to you about is a little bit more, um, like, I guess, super close to home. Um, because, uh, for example, um, and maybe more of your sort of personal strategies on uh, doing important work and useful work in data science. Cause I, I can't help but look at your work and things like um, this, the work that you're doing is important and just to contrast and not to throw Molotov cocktails or anything, but you know, it's like you can go to JSM and you can see people working on improving, you know, the accuracy of a P value from some approximation to an extra like 10,000th of a percent. It's like, okay, cool. It's like, no doubt that took a lot of math. Um, I'm not sure if that's like the, the big priority that we need to be handling right now. Or maybe I'm totally wrong. And for their particular application, it is. Um, but, you know, like I look at uh, work, like uh, people like yours, uh, Cynthia Rudins as well, where, you know, when she when she talks, she is literally solving problems that other people haven't even thought of asking yet. Um, and then she's also solving the problems to those problems that people haven't thought of. Um, Zubin Garamani comes to mind as someone who works on extremely important problems and they're intuitive too. So it's not like saying, oh, this is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just quickly, I think Neil, Neil Lawrence uh, pop, pops to mind as someone who works on like just very good scientist. Um, Aki Vitari uh, comes to mind as, you know, just like cool creative work. Um, and but it's all all useful. I um, mean, I know I'm missing a large number of other people there, but the sort of connecting theme, theme there is it seems important. And I know some of that's just sort of like subjective where I just think that, oh, this is a real problem, a real scientific problem. And th- these people are developing tools for scientists like myself. Um, and I was just wondering, like, how do you prioritize you only have a given number of hours in a day that you can work. You only have a given number of like, years left in your life. Um, how do you prioritize what you want to work on? And also, I guess, part of the distance, um, you have postdocs and doctoral students. How do you help your postdocs and doctoral students sort of prioritize their work and really get onto the line of things that are important? We'll talk about your uh, your doctoral students in a second, but um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, do you, do you have a grand strategy or is it just all, is it all, all gut? <laughs> I mean, I, I think I don't have a grand strategy. It's all mm-hmm. gut, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's just sort of like how I operate, I think. Mm-hmm. And so I, I tend to, yeah, as we've been talking about, I, I tend to try to be motivated by an applied problem and um, by collaborations with the scientists and that apply, applied discipline. I, I organically get a lot of people just kind of coming to me or they just show up and then I... I tend to be really curious about science in general. Um, my, my parents were biology professors, and I kind of grew up as their lab hand. And I, I just um, and so I'll talk to people. I don't know, like uh, this ecology collaboration, Atso of Askinen, a um, brilliant uh, kind of mathematical statistical ecologist, came to visit Alan Gelfand at Duke, and went out to lunch, and we started talking, and then like had a lot in common. We we're talking about modeling and everything, and then now we've written like you know at least a dozen papers, and we have this fifteen million dollar grant, and we're just like yeah meet every week, and like are thinking about models, and and then there's all these problems, applied problems that come up in that collaboration, and then you're you're trying to solve, you're you're trying to think, you know what are the important applied problems here, and how can we come up with something statistical that's going to address those problems and not be ideally not be incremental. And so because I have like multiple ag- like multiple agendas because like if I am advising a postdoc or student, like I have a responsibility and they want to go into academics, then I have a responsibility for them. They need to get papers in top journals. It's going to become increasingly competitive. So we need that. And I, 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 I need to be able to, like, we have, grant, we have, like, a responsibility from the funding agency to do a good job in these ecology applications or neuroscience or environmental health. 
and um, there's accountability there. And so we we want so we so that that also kind of we want to be able to say like here's a real world application. Here's something new statistically. We have a bit of theory. Um, and now we're like addressing some important problem that will solve all those problems. And so I'm, I'm, and that's sort of how I think anyway. And so, so I'm always looking for stuff like that. And, um, and then to be honest, it just kind of comes naturally. Like if I hear a talk, I'm, I'm kind of naturally like looking for holes in their reasoning. Like, well, um, and yeah, you applied this, whatever to this data, but then, it's like, well, why didn't they do something else for those data? Like, what what was actually the scientific question there? I have quite a bit of science background, and what well, what are they actually the scientists interested in? What could they have done instead? Um, and then that could turn into a different type of research direction. I have a new PhD student like that, and I, she's so fantastic because she's completely applied thinking. Like, she loves this ecology application, and so she's like. You know, we were looking at species abundance data, and then she she just thought of this thing I totally hadn't thought about at all. Like, um, how can you infer the actual abundance from this data that doesn't have abundance information in it directly? And she had all these ideas about that. She's meeting with ecologists, trying to look for different types of data. And then now you have this new type of the data. Well, how do you model it? How do you address that? And so that's, it's constantly a series of things like that, juggling all these types of problems like that. And it's just organic, I guess. Yeah. I, I've I've noticed that too, where it seems that a, a lot of um, there's a large amount of intuition um, that people have when they are doing. Um, there's so much intuition in science, um, and I guess the upside of that is that it does add this sort of fun magic uh, to the discovery process. It's always fun feeling your intuition also come to life and actually be proved out by data, where you think this into like I think more or less, for example, we could use this sort of method and regularize it in this way. And then, for example, all the better if like, we can have high predictive accuracy. And there's also cool descriptions that we can get from the data, for example, that we can then feed to the scientist or the clinician. Um, I, I did a bit of that where I was trying to uh, personalize time series models um, to patients, and essentially we uh, try to fit this uh, personalized priors over their time series and then say, okay, well, given that the, what those priors say, what does that actually describe about the patient's physiology? And then can we turn that into words and start popping that into clinicians? Um, and so that they have two things. One, they have a prediction, um, and then they also have a description about more of the model itself. And it was cool. And the reason, like, I could not... There, there are certain quantitative reasons why this could work, but also there's, a, like, a heavy amount of intuition about it. Um, the downside, of course, is that, of course, you, it's harder to teach other people intuition, um, which is obviously, you know, like, if yeah. you do try to systemize... yeah. Uh, systematize things. It's it's just difficult to do um, and hard to communicate. Um, but you have had very successful doctoral students and postdocs. Uh, Christian Lum comes to mind. Uh, James Yandro comes to mind. Um, was there anything that you saw good habits that they have um, or anything like that that sort of, because we will have a fairly young audience listening to some stuff. Were there certain like traits or characteristics or is it just you know, no people can't control their intelligence. Like you can't just say, you know, set intelligence to Christian Lum. Um, it, it, that 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 doesn't happen. It's not a phaser. Um, but you know, yeah. I mean, they they they. they I don't know if I would follow their their mold. Um, James was held up, just a great case because he came in. He he had like a background in chemistry, and then he um, he got a C in my class, and I, I give almost no Cs. You know, it's a grad school grades. They're almost Cs, like basically failing, and so he did terrible in my class. And then he um, he met Christian Lum, and they they got married after like a month. And like he moved to Brazil, and he said he he was going to do reading or something, and he was doing reading. Like he had got a bunch of statistics books, he was reading it. And James is just a rare he's just a rare intellect. Um, and and he came back, you know, and and he was just like, you know, he had learned all this mathematics. He started working with the 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 chair of the math department on math papers at the same time as working with me. So so he is just. Um, is just a special case, I think. He's just a br- brilliant mind. Um, I think for, you know, some of the more successful students, I think that I used to early in my career, you, what you don't want to do is use your students as your, like, hands. Yeah. Something like, I have this idea in my mind, go program this, come back next week. I, I try to establish a conversation with them and then try to um, to get them to take ownership and get them to glom on to what the game the game is in some sense and, and kind of how I think about problem solving and what's important. Um, and I think that, 
yeah, if, if I can get that across, maybe they come in like often. You they, maybe they might come in with a more theory background, but they don't know what to work on. They, they can like if you give them a math problem, they can like solve a proof, but they don't know what to do, and the, and they don't have um, often don't have any intuition for applications. Um, they 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 don't know like if you you talk to a scientist they have no idea what to do next they they don't know what type of models to fit they they don't have an intuition for how to go about that process and so I I try to talk to them about that and then have a back and forth um, um, and that, then hopefully after they've done that for some amount of time and we're going back and forth maybe they can take more ownership uh, ownership of the process. And yeah, I mean, I think that my most successful students and postdocs have been good at kind of glomming onto that. They, they maybe they come in with some technical skills, but then and then, then they kind of learn about the kind of applied intuition and game. People like Daniele Durante, um, he, he's just really fantastic at that sort of thing. He's he's much closer to me, I, I would think, um, in terms of like how I operate than James, um, who's like a math genius kind of thing. <laughs> um, and Chris, Christian, who's like also a rare, rare, rare person who works in a different way. Um, but, but yeah, Daniele, like you come in, you, you just, you kind of you quickly pick up on the applied context and try to start modeling a back and forth and then try to come up with the new framework and then you try to study it. And so, so yeah, it's an imperfect, I try to personalize it to the, uh, the student or postdoc as well. I, I, you start a conversation, they're all different, good at different things. I've had ones who are really, really theoretical, like, um, Yun Yang, who's like superstar and. He, 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 he went on to a postdoc with Martin um, Wainwright and Mike Jordan and proved some you know, fundamental results. And so, yeah, he's a theory guy, a bit, bit of an out machine learning kind of algorithm plus theory. And so that's what we worked on. And I, I'll adapt to the student as well and to their skill set. I'm not going to try to put them into, you know, the type, try, try to make, make them like a mini me or something. I, I'd like to try to um, steer them in the direction that where they can be productive to their skill set and independent, you know, I guess. Your application and independent. You know, I, I want them to be able to go go out and then be able to, to do it on their own. You know, and then they don't need me to tell them what to work on. But but now they've picked up on the process enough that that they can do it independently. That's my goal entirely. I, I don't care about getting papers with them. I, I want to kind of um, or making them be productive or like pushing them through to work through things. I want them to to get to the point where they can do this stuff, like cool research that's important uh, independently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is something. Um, I know that we only have a few minutes left, but it is something that I've noticed where um, a big distinction between um, very successful graduate programs, uh, elite graduate programs, and sort of, I would say, just less respected ones. And obviously, it's a little bit uncomfortable to draw lines about how successful given different graduate programs are. At the same time, it's impossible to ignore the fact that um, certain departments at certain universities are very good at pumping out independent, uh, the, uh, have a high proportion of successful independent researchers. Um, and that there are all at the same time, you know, you can contrast that to many people who will graduate from their doctorate and still aren't feeling comfortable as an independent researcher. Um, I can't help but notice, uh, for example, that like Duke produces a large uh, number, a large proportion of um independent researchers, uh, the Cambridge Engineering Department, you know, with uh, Zubin Garamani, with the, um, uh, with that group, um, David Duveno is, is an example where, um, and uh, Andrew Gordon um, Wilson, uh, th that group where it's just, you can't ignore that each, like, it's again, it's, it's just like this little sun of uh, density, flame and energy where just all this stuff is coming out of and um, they produce very good work. But yeah, I'm, I'm always curious to see what people's different strategies are for making good independent researchers. So I appreciate that. Um, one final question is, um, I noticed that um, Duke University, uh, you don't have a statistics department. Your, your department is uh, statistical science. And I thought that was very interesting because uh, Oxford, uh, we don't have an engineering department. We have a department of engineering science. And we sort of take that science uh, appendage seriously. Um, is, that, is, is that an important uh, distinction? Um, I mean, I, I think it, it relates to your previous point about Duke doing a good job. I mean, because um, I think a lot of us, you would say like Mike West, and Alan Gelfand, et cetera, like uh, we, we've been producing a lot of students, uh, many of the students um, historically over the last number of years. And and we're all scientists, you know, and so and, and, are, and, and, and the hierarchy at Duke is very flat. 
Um, and so this, the, the, the students are interacting with each other. And it's not like this kind of entrenched giant labs. Um, I mean, it can be the students are working with different professors um, and talking to each other and, and not, not as competitive, and, uh, uh, but more of like an intellectual um, atmosphere. And I, I think Mike, um, Mike was one of the real you know, kind of founders, Mike West, of the department. It was originally the Institute of Statistics and Decision Sciences. And I think he, his, his vision of like really it being science, um, you know, using statistics for science and statistics as a science in its own respect, both of those things, I think, are the identity of our department, um, really, I think. And so, and also being very collaborative and inter interdisciplinary. And so, so I think that, yeah, some people say that any time um, a, a, the, the discipline has science in it, it isn't. <laughs> like computer <laughs> science or something is, a, is an old joke. But I, I think that, you know, um, statistical science is the right term. And we're, we're, it's not just statistics absence of science, but like an interaction between science and statistics and science uh, uh, statistics as a science. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, I like the atmosphere at Duke a lot. It's quite quite unique in that sense. And I, I would say like Ox, probably Oxford statistics as well is um, is like that. And there, there there's a number of other places that are really kind of intellectual homes of di discourse um, and really trying to build tools for science, but also develop statistics carefully as a science at, at the same time. And, and that's what statistical science is, I think. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, just for those who are curious, I, I have sent out a large number of invitations and many people at, uh, at uh, the Oxford Statistics Department to get them to come on and start having some of these conversations. So I won't name names, but uh, given that I've just emailed David Dunson. You can probably guess who some of those people are. Um, they, they have a great, um, a great department in Oxford. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lot, a lot of people to uh, to select from, um, and I'm trying to get them all on. Uh, but yeah, uh, anyway, David, thanks so much for your time. Was it? Were there any sort of final follow up thoughts or? I guess not. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so a lot much for inviting me and for the for the conversation. Hey guys, it's Glenn. Thanks for your time today. I hope you liked today's episode. If you did, please consider smashing that like button. It's the single simplest, fastest way to make sure that YouTube shows this video to more people. If you really want to go crazy, consider subscribing or going to our website and joining the mail list. If you want to go totally crazy beyond that, forward this to a friend or colleague who you think might enjoy this too. We're a small channel and every bit helps. Our next episode will be coming out next week. So in the meantime, feel free to look around the channel and see other videos that might be of interest. As a quick disclaimer, the views expressed on the show do not represent anything other than the people saying those words, views, etc. like that. It doesn't mean anything about their employers or their employer's views or some thing about their employers or their neighbor's cat or anyone else not saying the words. And in fact, given that people tend to change their views when they're thoughtful enough, it might not even represent the views of the speaker by the time you're hearing the episode. So definitely come back and see if they've changed their views at a later date. They also don't represent the views of our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsors. You can check them out on our website.